Okay, so okay, let let's get started. So before, let me introduce myself uh, very quickly. Uh, my name is Bruno. I I work at, uh, in the Pop Kiwi uh, three years ago, uh, and then I moved to Automation Hub as a software engineer. And yeah, so right now I'm working developing Ansible Galaxy, which is using uh, Pop uh, to manage Ansible collections and and container image uh, for Ansible execution environment. And uh, seven years ago, I created this Python tool uh, called DynaConf. I created this before I joined the company and uh, it started being used by some Python uh, projects. And then uh, today my in this talk, I want to talk about what is DynaConf because I know a lot of people heard about it, but uh, it's as it's embedded in, in, in Pulp, uh, not everyone needs to interact directly with it. So just a little bit of history and then how Pulp uses it and what I think it would be nice to Pulp to start using uh, of the features and also what's coming on the next version that we are working on. So I didn't prepare any slides, so it's going to be all in the terminal. So hopefully everything is going to work. Um, so seven years ago, I needed a library to read environment variables. So DynaConf uh, was born to read only environment variables. So everything that's designed there was specific to read this kind of data. And uh, the requirements was we need a way to read prefixed environment variables. So for example, I have an application which I'm going to call my app. So you can call anything. Like in pop today, it's pop underline the prefix. So I'm gonna uh, export like a name, and this name is gonna be Bruno. So I have this in my environment, and I need a way to read it in Python. So it's easy to read it in Python without any kind of external uh, library. Uh, but that was not the only goal. Uh, we wanted a way to have a type annotated or uh, a type parsing on environment variables. So for example, if I have like my age here, uh, 18, um, you know that environment variables are all strings when it's read it to Python. I wanted to have this uh, inferred as the actual integer or float or any kind of uh, type that we usually use in Python. At that point, we decided to use TOML, uh, T-O-M-L language, uh, to parse this data. So basically, you can here pass any valid uh, TOML uh, data type. So I can pass, like for example, a dictionary key and a value. If it's a TOML valid uh, format, then a conf is going to parse it and expose as a Python dictionary or a list or anything that TOML uh, supports. That decision was because almost everyone was moving to TOML as a format for configuration, like Python adopted on PyProject.toml, Rust uses config.toml. So uh, at that point, it was a good idea uh, to do that. Uh, and also you can, uh, you can force uh, the typing of uh, an environment variable using these markers. Uh, we call it tokens. So you can have a token for every data type that Python supports, like a float, a Boolean. Uh, so there is a, a collection of tokens you can use. And we use these tokens as like a mini language for DynaConf. For example, if I want to merge data uh, from environment variable to an existing data that I have, I can use the merge uh, here, uh, we have a large set of uh, uh, tokens, and it's extendable, so the user can create new tokens. If your application loads, for example, data from AWS secrets uh, <clears throat> management, you can have a AWS token here and talk to that uh, external uh, source of data using this. Uh, but basically, it's just a way to have a way uh, a language to specify typing and format for environment variables. Uh, another thing that we wanted is that uh, the variables are structured. So I can have, for example, a dictionary here, like I call it data. And this data is going to have uh, nesting uh, information. So for example, my ID uh, 
is this number. If I have my security, social security number, I can pass like this. And you can see it follows the Django uh, defaults to have the use of double underline to access nested keys. So if I need something more nested, I can like create more nested uh, keys like this and there's no limit, uh, just you keep exporting those variables and uh, internally it's going to feed uh, like it was a dot notation. Um, and then um, this also allows us to merge existing data with uh, data that's exported in the environment variable. So basically that was the goal uh, at the beginning uh, and also dynamic environment variables, hence the name. Uh, the name Dynaconf came uh, from the need to have dynamic environment variables. So imagine I have this uh, name here, which is Bruno, and I'm going to use something from Python internally. And I need to create like a path so I can export like my app path. And then I can use Jinja. So Jinja is also another very common uh, template language for uh, creating configuration in Ansible or other tooling. So I can export a variable like this and use anything that Jinja template allows me to use inside the variable itself. So uh, that's the dynamic part of loading and you can do any kind of expression there. Uh, Dynaconf came with uh, CLI. So using the CLI, you can list um, uh, the variables of your application, but to be able to list, it needs uh, a valid Dynaconf application. Uh, so at this moment, you can like create your app. I'll create a file called app here. And I have uh, this. So you import from Dynaconf the base Dynaconf class. You create your settings object and you set the prefix of your uh, settings object to whatever you want. And then you are able to start listing your environment variables. So at this point, everything I did on environment variables is loaded here. So I have a name, which is string, integer, uh, uh, with the age, which is an integer, a dictionary that was parsed via environment variables using all the nested things. And the path resolve it. Uh, it does lazy loading of this. So the time I read, it's going to resolve this data in, in by the Jinja form, the needed uh, variable I want. So this is basically uh, what Dynaconf does. It looks like really simple thing, uh, but then we added support for files and then we start having like more features. So for example, if you want to load your files, your settings from multiple files, you can, for example, has a settings.yaml uh, and then you can load uh, variables from YAML. You can have the same from JSON, mini, or yeah, there are seven formats that are built in. Uh, and also you can read from a Python object or external sources. In this example, I'm gonna say just the uh, YAML. And then here, I'm gonna create this YAML as uh, an example. So all the variables I exported as environment variables, I can include on YAML or I can mix them. So uh, in this example, I'm gonna load everything that's on YAML and environment variables always has the higher precedence. So it's gonna be overriding everything on the files. If I have a list of multiple files, uh, it's gonna follow the order I define. So the last file overrides everything the first one uh, exported. Uh, and that's the way Pope uses this today. So in, in this configuration on the Pope app uh, settings, you have all the plugins contributing to this list. So Pope Ansible includes the settings.py here, uh, Pope container, all the installed plugins is going to define a settings to be loaded in the proper ordering. And as it's a YAML file, you can have anything, like you can change the name here. Uh, I'm gonna put some name. And then I can run my app. Uh, or I can use Dynaconf list uh, and show uh, the information I have here. As you can see, environment variables always have the precedence. If I want to be able to um, override, I need to unset the environment variable, and then I have the name written from uh, YAML. 
At this point, everything works in the YAML. You can use the tokens. You can use everything you need. Uh, but then uh, with the files, uh, we got another uh, feature, which is the multiple environments. So if you have an application running in the development environment, you can have a specific set of configuration in production or in testing. So we added the ability to have environments. Uh, and then environments can be anything you want, like, for example, development and production. Uh, th this are like the basics. Uh, another product that's using this internally is IQE, uh, the testing framework. They have uh, an environment for each uh, name of like Jenkins master. So you can use any string here. And then your settings file files is going to look differently. So you're going to have a default, uh, which is the base environment. You're going to have the development environment with the name of the developer. And you're going to have the production environment with the settings uh, for like the production, for example. Uh, you can have a single file, as I said, or you can have multiple files. Uh, there is no problem uh, if you have multiple files. It's going to merge everything, and then it keeps working. Uh, when you have multiple environments, Dynaconf works by default using development. Uh, and then if you want to change, you need to export a environment variable called m for Dynaconf. And then I'm going to say it's going to run in production mode, and then it takes the name from production environment. Yeah, so I think here I basically showed the basic feature features. Uh, but then we started having more uh, contributions from outside of the company I was working at that time. And someone wanted to read secrets from HashiCorp Vault or from etcd. And then we added support uh, to read um, from external sources. So I'm not going to show here because I need to start containers with Vault or Redis. Uh, but it's possible to have external loaders like Redis, uh, Vault, etcd. Uh, AWS Secrets Management or uh, Postgres JSON is also supported. So you configure how Dynaconf will talk with that uh, storages. And then you can have like all those keys stored on, on there. Uh, and this is really useful because it empowers a thing we are, which is the feature flag system. So Dynaconf has a built-in feature, feature flag system. So when you use feature flag, every time you access a variable, Dynaconf is going to be reloading from the source uh, to you can make your conditionals based on, on that variables. Uh, and yeah, so I think right now that's the main things. And there are two challenges of maintaining a library of this uh, kind. One is we need really 100% of test coverage, and we do. Uh, there is no pull requests that are accepted without 100% of test coverage, both uh, unit testing and functional testing. Uh, we don't want to have like some kind of scenario where we are uh, mixing or doing the wrong thing because we are dealing with secrets, we are dealing with database access. So it's really important to have lots of testing. Another thing that's difficult is the merging part, uh, because for Django specifically, you have lots of nesting inside the settings. Uh, you have that databases thing, you have that uh, templates uh, list. So too much nesting information to be merging, and merging is really difficult to resolve. Not every user wants to merge the information uh, using the same approach. So this is something we are trying to improve uh, on every uh, release. And another thing that is important when you have multiple sources. So in this simple example, you have environment variable and you have a single settings file. But if you take pop as example and you install all the plugins, you're going to have all the plugins providing a specific settings file. You're going to have uh, the user that can export environment variables. And you're going to have the user that can include an etc pop settings file uh, that's also going to be loaded. So uh, now I'm going to talk about that second topic, which is um, how pop can start using uh, some of the features. 
One of the features we have beauty right now uh, is the validators. So validators is a list you pass to the DynaConf object. Then you create uh, using the base validator class, uh, which is exposed uh, by DynaConf. And you can set some rules for the settings. Yeah, so uh, for example, if I want my name variable uh, to be required, I can say that it's required true. The application will never load without uh, this specific variable. I can have some operators like not equals equal uh, Bruno. So at my uh, application will not load if I have a name that equals Bruno because my business logic doesn't allow it. Uh, so for this example, I'm going to remove this uh, environment and make it easier again, uh, easier to show. So in this case, uh, if I run the application uh, in this way, uh, let me run it directly uh, from the file app. I'm going to print here some information. I'm going to print the name. Uh, so I have the name John, and I have this validator saying that cannot be Bruno. Uh, so if at any point someone exports it or save it as Bruno and run, Vanaconf is going to validate and throw a validation error uh, saying that name must be not Bruno, but it's Bruno for some reason. Um, so this is something we need to like start thinking about, including on Pope. Uh, so a, a set of validators in a way for each plugin, uh, plugin writer to provide the settings along with the validator for the settings, uh, because as we have multiple sources of data, uh, we can have really bad things happening. Uh, so this is an important thing. Uh, how DynaConf works in Django, I think. I, I'm not looking to the questions yet. I see some messages, but let me talk about Django first. So in Django, when you have DynaConf installed and configured, and you do uh, from Django.conf import settings, Actually, what you get back is not a settings from Django. So Vanaconf replaces the Django settings object. It, it not replaces, it wraps the Django settings object and you get a Dynaconf lazy set settings. So every time you use uh, a settings in Pope or in any plugin, you are actually using not Django settings, but Dynaconf settings. So it looks the same. You can access like, for example, databases, uh, it's going to be the same uh, set of data, but it's going to be wrapped in a DynaConf box. And why this happens? Because this DynaConf box has some abilities to be dynamic and to extend that DynaConf language. Uh, at some moment, if some user wants to override the settings, uh, an environment variable can be exported, like databases under under uh, default, under under engine. And then it can set to anything else. Uh, and then at this moment, the engine is changed to an environment variable or external source. And this source of data, uh, this call I made here, settings.set, it is what this the loaders do. So you can create your own loaders. Uh, for example, if you, for some reason, you have your settings in a, a CSV file, it's crazy, but maybe it's a possibility. You can write a loader and include in your DynaConf object, and then it's going to try to read something like this from your CSV file and uh, use this pattern to override it. So uh, that's how we, we do. And that's why you're going to see like some uh, Pope installer, for example, using underscores to export environment variables. The difference is that in the environment, it should have the Pope underline uh prefix to be uh able to to load uh and then we with this uh now i have to talk about something that happened recently uh when we do things like this uh for example i have the settings file like this one uh, similar to what pop has in pop core app settings uh one of the last things you have is the dynaconf being loaded uh wrapping the settings after this, you can do some assertions, you can do some testing, or you can use DynaConf validators. Uh, it's going to work the same uh, if you fail correctly. Um, but we are not allowed 
uh, to do conditionals in the settings. So this is something really common in the Django community. When you have a settings file, uh, let me open here just to be an example. Uh, if you have a settings file, it's common that you come here and you do like, if base dir is something, then I'm gonna change some variable to any other thing. Uh, with Panaconf, this is one of the caveats because it's not possible. Uh, if you are on a plugin, if you are on the hope core, it's going to work. But if you are doing this in a plugin settings, it's not going to work because the plugin is not the full uh, settings. So that settings file is going to be merged with all the other plugin settings files with all the environment. So we don't have the information yet to do the conditional. You need to uh, the Dynaconf lifecycle to finish. So you have the settings object already format to start doing conditionals. So what we did, we added a new uh, file. So in this example, I have a plugin. And inside that plugin, I have a Dynaconf hooks object. So we added this specific for Pope and the plugins. So a plugin like uh, Galaxy is doing today can include a file called Dynaconf hooks uh, together with the settings. And we have pre hooks and post hooks. So the post hooks uh, is called after the settings are loaded. And then inside the hooks, you can do anything you want with this, the settings. So you can change the settings. You can do conditionals with the settings. And the data you return here, the dictionary, is what is going to be merged back to the settings object. So everything works here. Uh, so this is just uh, something we solved recently. Uh, and then I think I still have like five minutes or three minutes. Uh, I'm going to talk now about what's coming in Dynaconf for zero, what the changes that I'm trying to do. So for showing that, I'm going to change here my environment. Um, so in this environment, I have Dynaconf version uh, development version. Um, we're going to have a 3.2 soon with bug fixes only, no changes. And then after this 3.2, there will be no 3.3. Uh, the next one is going to be the 4.0, which is going to be not a breaking, really breaking, but some things we need to be done by uh, users to uh, allow. Uh, so first thing, this way of validating data is really nice. Uh, it's okay to use it and to extend it. It's easy to extend like plugins contributing with validators, uh, something that other users are already doing. Uh, but what we are adding as Python is like migrating to type annotation. Uh, most of the communities starting using type annotation. We are going to move the recommendation for you to have your own settings class. And your settings class is going to be a subclass of Dynaconf. And then instead of writing validators this way, you're going to say like name is a string, age is an integer using Python type annotations. And then uh, Dynaconf takes into account the type annotations uh, using the same thing like data classes or Pydantic does. And with this, it's already possible to have uh, the validation. So. Uh, in this case, nothing happens because I only have a name. Uh, but for example, if I pass here an age, and this age is something that's not an integer, and I try to run, uh, probably I have exported. Um, let me unset the age I have exported here. Uh, and then it's going to fail saying, well, there is a schema error. Uh, we expected integer, and you got me a string. So. The validation is going to be based on type. And also, you can use fields uh, together with the class. And then the field follows the Pydantic style. So you can provide the false. Uh, you can provide factories to generate that settings. Uh, with that defaults, you can have a way to create the full settings files for the user. For example, user installed pop. And there is no ATC settings pope in place. So users can run Dynaconf, create settings, and everything you set on the schema is going to be outputted to that uh, place as a template for uh, a settings file. 
And we are moving from validators like this to validators using expressions. So you can have validators equal a list and it is really uh, string based expressions because it's easier to write. Uh, for example, I don't want my, I need my age to be higher or equal 18. Uh, so if some user uh, with age 16 tries to run my application, uh, it's gonna, I think I have this exported here. Uh, age. Oh, I don't have it. Probably I have it in another file. Let me print age here. I know that when we do live coding, some things doesn't work the way we want. Okay, so it's 18, now it's 16. Yeah, that worked. Uh, something was wrong in my environment. But anyway, the expression failed. Uh, if the uh, age is 16, it's not gonna work. So basically we are moving from a specific Dynaconf class validator to use Python type annotated validators. And then you can, as application or plugin, provide your own schema based on the type system of Python or all the typing uh, model it's gonna work and the second change uh together with this so you can now use a, a schema is that today when you do pip install dynaconf you get everything so you get the feature flag system you get loaders for yaml json wini toml python and uh there's other formats that i don't even remember you get redis vault etcd and every other kind of thing embedded and that's too much uh for example in the case of Pope, Pope is not using anything at this. Uh, Pope is not using YAML and Tomo, just the bare environment variable plus Python. So what we are going to do is we are going to split Dynacon source code into a core and multiple plugins. So the core is gonna be only environment variables plus Python and everything else should be delivered in form of a plugin. So we're gonna have a Dynacon YAML uh, if you want YAML files, you're going to need to install Dynaconf and Dynaconf YAML. If you want YAML and JSON, you need to install Dynaconf JSON. So for every specific loader or every specific feature, uh, a, a plugin. Uh, and for doing that, we open the doors for others to create other plugins and extend the library with other things. Yeah, are so you breaking I, this up into multiple repositories? Or how are you going to manage this? Yeah, so I think breaking multiple repositories, that's the idea. So I'm um, talking right now, we have uh, five contributors. Um, we have more. If you go to the GitHub repository, there are, I think, six to eight people that contributed historically. Uh, but currently, it's only me. Uh, I'm the maintainer, and I really do most of this implementation on my free time. And we have four four more people that are actively contributing to do bug fixing, testing. And yeah, so I'm start talking about creating a, an organization, Dynaconf, and then all the plugins is gonna live there. Uh, so this is really up to discussion if it's gonna be a, a mono repo or multiple repo. Uh, but we really want to have a lean core. So the, the main, library is going to be really small uh, for the projects that doesn't need everything and everything else is going to be provided by plugins and yeah so i can take any kind of suggestion you have as pop uses multiple plugins i i want to learn about that pain points and and not to and doing the best way that's also yeah well so that's all i think i'm over time <laughs> I hope it was uh, um, useful to learn a little bit on what Dynaconf does and, and why, do we, how Pop uses it. And Do we have time for one question? I can also take it off air. I think we have time. We have nothing, we have nothing ahead of us. So I think okay. we can have awesome. Florian's got um, a question in chat too. 
So. Django provides uh, facilities for uh, changing settings during unit tests. Yeah, so and uh, how is... do you uh, see Dynaconf pro helping with that also? Because right now I have a bug where I'm not able to override the setting. <laughs> Yeah, so it worked with Django is, 2, but not Django 3. Yeah, this bug is fixed on Dynaconf Master. It's not released yet. So I think three two weeks ago, uh, it was fixed. Uh, now you can do like use that um, with settings uh, yeah. manager. So in, yes, OK. Yeah, cool. so <laughs> this got fixed. And you can use also that decorator that overrides settings. It's, it's resolved uh, on Master. It's gonna be some one of the things we're gonna release in three one one eight. Uh, I'm really that? needing to do more testing around that, uh, but it's it's fixed. Yeah. And but there is awesome. one thing that is not fixed, uh, and I don't know how to fix it. Uh, it's related to Django, and yeah. So I don't know if even if it's going to be possible to fix it, which is the translation. So uh, there are applications that uses that lazy get text to do translations. And as Dynaconf object loads before Django, so you load that object and you load all the settings. And then after you do that, you wrap the Django one. Uh, there is a life cycle problem where we don't have yet access to Django application. Uh, to be able to provide the lazy get text. So right now, the setting is not possible to translate settings keys. So we had a situation with a user from Twilio, I think, uh, that they filled uh, an issue. They wanted to have a, like a enum in the settings where the to provide choices for a model and that choices needed to be translated and it was not possible inside the setting. So I'm open to have contributions to work on that because I don't have any idea on how to solve that. Uh, but the testing part is, is already fixed. Yeah. And also I have to note the other thing. When I created the Flask plugin, it was really easy because Flask by default, provides a way for us to override the config class. So you can create a Flask application and pass a new config class, and everything works by default. But Django doesn't provide any way for us to replace their settings object. So that's why Dynaconf really wraps that object uh, using the Python import system. So Dynaconf goes into the sys models and wraps the settings to be able to uh, create some kind of interface for it. Uh, so I should start talking with Django devs to thinking about a way to open the settings object to be extended in some way. Yeah. So this is something I've been thinking about. So because what we do right now is a kind of a hack. It's not a hack because it uses the official Python way of doing it uh, using the the sys models, but uh, it would be preferable to be something explicit, like I go to my Django application and I say that I want to use a specific settings implementation. Yeah. That's all. OK, Doc. Any last questions going once? Florian had a question about adding readable error messages. I don't know if Brian, if you got an answer to that. No. Okay. Uh, readable error messages to the validators. Uh, right now, there is a way to override the message for each validator, so each validator can accept a messages dictionary. Uh, but it's going to be arrays of a validation error. So if you don't treat the error, you're going to see the full trace back by the flow. Yeah. One of the options would be like using the system as it and exiting with the error message without showing the trace back. Uh, possible, uh, but not implemented right now. Yeah. 
Okay, Doc. So, yep. thanks. Thank you. Thanks for your questions, guys. Thanks, Bruno, very much for your time. Um, a few Thank of you. the, a few people with Portuguese surnames um, appeared onto Twitter and started liking and um, nice. you know, saying hi and stuff. So, thank thanks for bringing your uh, followers along for the session. And um, okay, I'll just end the recording. And this is the end of day 